David Copperfield by Charles Dickens, Chapter 7, My First Half at Salem House. School began in earnest the next day. A profound impression was made upon me, I remember, by the roar of voices in the schoolroom suddenly becoming hushed as death when Mr. Creakle entered after breakfast and stood in the doorway looking round upon us like a giant in a storybook surveying his captives. Tungi stood at Mr. Creakle's elbow. He had no occasion, I thought, to cry out, Silence! so ferociously, for the boys were all struck speechless and motionless. Mr. Creakle was seen to speak, and Tungay was heard to this effect. Now, boys, this is a new half. Take care what you're about in this new half. Come fresh up to the lessons. I advise you, for I come fresh up to, up to the punishment. I won't flinch. It will be of no use. You're rubbing yourselves. You won't rub the marks out that I shall give you. Now get to work, every boy. When this dreadful... Exordium was over, and Tungay had stumped out again. Mr. Creakle came to where I sat and told me that if I were famous for biting, he was famous for biting too. He then showed me the cane and asked me what I thought of that for a tooth. Was it a sharp tooth, eh? Was it a double tooth, eh? Had it a deep, had it a deep prong, eh? Did it bite, eh? Did it bite? At every question... He gave me a flashy cut with it that made me writhe, so I was very soon made free of Salem House and Steerforth also, and was very soon in tears also. I should think there never can be, there never can have been a man who enjoyed his profession more than Mr. Creakle did. He had a delight in cutting at the boys, which was like the satisfaction of a craving appetite. I am confident that he couldn't resist a chubby boy especially, that there was a fascination in such a subject which made him restless in his mind until he had scored and marked him for the day. I was chubby myself, you ought to know. Poor Traddles, in, tight, in a tight sky-blue suit that made his arms and legs like German sausages or roly-poly puddings, he was the merriest and most miserable of all the boys. He was always being caned. I think he was caned every day that half year, except one holiday, Monday, when he was was only rulered on both hands, and was always going to write his, to his uncle about it, and never did. After laying his head on the desk for a little while, he would cheer up somehow, begin to laugh again, and draw skeletons all over his slate before his eyes were dry. I used at first to wonder what comfort Traddles found in drawing skeletons. I believe he only did it because they were easy and didn't want any features. There was one advantage, and only one that I know of, in Mr. Creakle's severity. He found my placard in his way when he came up or down behind the form in which I, on which I sat and wanted to make a cut at me in passing. For this reason, I was soon taken off. An accidental circumstance cemented the intimacy between Steerforth and me. It happened on one occasion when I was doing, when he was doing me the honor of talking to me in the playground, that I hazarded the observation that something or somebody, I forgot what now, was like something or somebody in Peregrine Pickle. He said nothing at the time, but when I was going to bed at night, he asked me if I had got that book. I told him no, and explained how it was that I had read it, and all those other books which I have of which I have made mention. And uh, do you recollect them? Steerforth said. Oh, yes, I replied. And I believed I recollected them very well. Then I tell you what, young Copperfield, said Steerforth, you shall tell them to me. I can't get to sleep very early at night, and I generally wake rather early in the morning. We'll go over them one after another. We'll make a regular, some regular Arabian nights of it. I felt extremely flattered by this arrangement, and we commenced carrying it into execution that very evening. The drawback was that I was often sleepy at night, and then it was rather hard work, and it must be done for, n for to disappoint or displease Steerforth was, of course, out of the question. In the morning, too, it was a tiresome thing to be roused, like the Sultana Scheherazade and forced into a long story, before getting up bell before the getting up bell rang, but Steerforth was resolute, and as he explained to me in return, 
My sums and exercises and anything in my task that was too hard for me, I was no loser by the transaction. I was much assisted by Mr. Mel, who had a liking for me that I am grateful to remember. It always gave me pain to observe that Steerforth treated him with systematic disparagement and seldom lost the occasion of wounding his feelings or inducing others to do so. One day, when Mr. Creakle kept the house from indisposition, which naturally diffused a lively joy through the, through the school, there was a good deal of noise in the course of the morning's work. It was the day of the week on which Mr. Sharp went out to get his wig curled, so Mr. Mel, who always did the drudgery, whatever it was, kept school by himself. If I could associate the idea of a bull or a bear with anyone so mild as Mr. Mel, I should think of him in connection with that afternoon when the uproar was at its height. As one of those animals, who, as one of those animals baited by a thousand dogs, boys started in and out of their places, playing at puss in the corner with other boys. There were laughing boys, singing boys, talking boys, dancing boys, howling boys. Boys shuffled with their feet. Boys whirled about him, grinning, making faces, mimicking him behind his back and before his e and before his eyes. Silence! cried Mr. Mel, rising up and striking his desk with a book. What does this mean? It's impossible to bear it. It's maddening. How can you do it to me, boys? It was my book that he struck his, his desk with. And soon I stood beside him, following his eye as he glanced around the room. I saw the boys all stop, some suddenly surprised, some half afraid, and some sorry, perhaps. Steerforth's place was at the bottom of the school at the opposite end of the long room. He was lounging with his back against the wall, and his hands in his pockets, and looked at Mr. Mel with his mouth shut up as if he were whistling when Mr. Mel looked at him. Silence, Mr. Steerforth, said Mr. Mel. Silence yourself, said Steerforth, turning red. Who are you talking to? Sit down, said Mr. Mel. Sit down yourself, said Steerforth, and mind your business. There was a titter and some applause, but Mr. Mel was so white that silence immediately succeeded. You think, Steerforth, said Mr. Mel, that I am not acquainted with the power you can establish over any mind here. He laid his hand, without considering what he did, as I supposed, upon my head. Or that I have not observed your urging your juniors on to every sort of outrage against me. You are mistaken. I don't give myself the trouble of thinking at all about you, said Steerforth coolly. So I'm not mistaken as it happens. And when you make use of your position of favoritism here, sir, pursued Mr. Mel with his lip trembling very much, to insult a gentleman. A what? Where is he? said Steerforth. Here somebody cried out, Shame, J. Steerforth, too bad! It was Traddles, whom Mr. Mel instantly discomfited by bidding him hold his tongue. To insult one who is not fortunate in life, sir, and who never gave you the least offence, and the many reasons for not insulting... Whom you are old enough and wise enough to understand, said Mr. Mel, with his lip trembling more and more. You commit a mean and base action. You can sit down or stand up as you please, sir. Copperfield, go on. Young Copperfield, said Steerforth, coming forward up the room. Stop a bit. I tell you what, Mr. Mel, once and for all, when you take the liberty of calling me mean or base or anything of that sort, you are an impudent bugger, beggar. You are always a beggar, you know. But when you do that, you are an impudent beggar. I am not clear whether he was going to strike Mr. Mel or Mr. Mel was going to strike him, or if there was any such intention on either side. I saw, rigidly, come upon the whole school as if they had been turned to stone and found Mr. Creakle in the midst of us, with Tungay at his side and Mrs. and, and, Mrs. and Miss Creakle looking in the door as if they were frightened. Mr. Mel with his elbows on his desk and his face in his hands, sat for some moments quite still. Mr. Mel, said Mr. Creakle, shaking him by the arm. And his whisper was so audible now that Tungay felt it unnecessary to repeat his words. Mr. Mel, said Mr. Creakle, shaking him by the arm. And his whisper was so audible now that Tungay felt it unnecessary to repeat his words. You have not forgotten yourself, I hope. No, 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 sir, no, returned the master, showing his face and shaking his head and rubbing his hands in great agitation. No, sir, no, I have remembered myself. I, no, Mr. Creakle, I have not forgotten myself. I, I have remembered myself, sir. I, 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 I wish you had remembered me a little sooner, Mr. Creakle. It, it would have been 
more kind, sir. Just, it would have saved me something, sir. Mr. Creakle, looking hard at Mr. Mel, put his hand on Tungay's shoulder and got his feet upon the form close by and sat upon the desk. After still looking hard at Mr. Mel from this throne as he shook his head and rubbed his hands and remained in the same state of agitation, Mr. Creakle turned to steer forth and said, Now, sir, as he don't condescend to tell me, what is this? Steerforth evaded the question for a little while, looking in scorn and anger on his opponent and remaining silent. I could not help thinking, even in that interval, I remember what a noble fellow he was in appearance and how homely and plain Mr. Mel looked opposite him. What did he mean by talking about favorites, then? said Steerforth at length. Favorites, repeated Mr. Creakle, with the veins in his forehead swelling quickly. Who talked about favorites? He did, said Steerforth. And pray, what did you mean by that, sir? demanded Mr. Creakle, turning angrily on his assistant. I meant, Mr. Creakle, he returned in a low voice, as I said, that no pupil had a right to avail himself of his position to favoritism to degrade me. To degrade you, said Mr. Creakle. My stars would give me leave to ask you, Mr. What's-Your-Name, and here Mr. Creakle folded his arms, cane and all, about it upon his chest and made such a knot of his brows that his little eyes were hardly visible below them. Whether when you talk about favorites, you showed proper respect to me, to me, sir, said Mr. Creakle, darting his head at him suddenly and drawing it back again. The principal of this establishment and your employer... It was not judicious, sir, I am willing to admit, said Mr. Mel. I should not have done so if I had been cool. Here Steerforth struck in. He said that I was mean. And then he said I was base. And then I called him a beggar. If I had been cool, perhaps I should have called... I shouldn't have called him a beggar, but I did. And I am ready to take consequences of it. Without considering, perhaps, whether there were any consequences to be taken, I felt quite in a glow of this gallant speech. It made an impression on the boys, too, for there was a low stir among them, though no one spoke a word. I am surprised, Steerforth, although your candor does you honor, said Mr. Creakle. Does you honor? Certainly I am surprised, Steerforth, I must say. You should attach such an epithet to any person employed and paid in Salem House, sir. Steerforth gave a short laugh. That is not an answer, sir, said Mr. Creakle. To my remark, I expect more than that from you, Steerforth. Mr. Mel looked homely in my eyes before, this, before the handsome boy. It would be quite impossible to say how homely Mr. Creakle looked. Let him, den let him deny it, said Steerforth. Deny? He is a beggar, Steerforth, cried Mr. Creakle. Why, where does he go a-begging? If he is not a beggar himself... His near relations one, said Steerforth. What I have to say is that his mother lives on charity in an almshouse. Mr. Creakle turned to his assistant with a severe frown and laboured politeness. Now you hear what this gentleman says, Mr. Mel. Have the goodness, if you please, to set him right before the assembled school. He is right, sir, without correction, returned Mr. Mel in the midst of dead silence. What he has said is true. Be so good, then, as declare yourself publicly, will you? said Mr. Creakle, putting his head on one side, rolling his eyes round the school. Whether it ever came to my knowledge until this moment, I believe not directly, he returned, and we will pause there. <laughs>